So yesterday we ended talking about Harry Harlow and Harry's rhesus monkeys and how comfort was really important to our social development that we could not, these monkeys could not, you know, they could not blend in uh, and, and function normally in a rhesus monkey society when they were not given some sort of comfort that they got from the cloth mother. So um, we watched a little video clip of Harry Harlow and his monkeys. Um, today, we're going to expand on the importance of attachment and social development. So there is a, a, a psychologist named Mary Ainsworth, and um, I do want you to kind of follow along with this video with the slides in Schoology. So I do post the slides in Schoology because I cannot play this video for you now because I would be breaking like copyright law uh, for me playing this video inside my video. But you need to go and watch this video right here about Mary Ainsworth and the strange situation, which was the name of her experiment. So what she did is she had mothers bring their babies into like this, uh, think about uh, like a doctor's office, like waiting room type of setting, um, and then leave the baby um, just for a little bit and see how the baby reacts. Not when the mother leaves, because all babies will cry when the mother leaves. It, it was about what happens when the mother comes back in the room. And so there are two types of uh, attachment. There's several types, but the two that we need to talk about is secure versus insecure attachment. So all babies, whether they're securely attached or insecurely attached, are going to cry when the mother leaves. It's what happens when the mother returns. It's about the reunion of how the baby reacts to the mother's return. So securely attached babies will calm down and stop crying at the mother's return. They all are, are going to get comfort right away and they're going to then, you know, go and explore the environment once she returns. Like so she's come, they are comforted by her presence, um, which makes sense because you know the reason that these babies get upset is that the mother leaves. The mother returning should bring them comfort, and for securely attached babies, they do. For insecurely attached babies, either the baby is avoidant and does not want to like still keeps crying but is like kind of ignoring the mother's presence and cannot be comforted by her or they get really angry with her and they try and they they resist any form of comfort and what you know what makes these babies like this well for most babies most babies are securely attached those babies have had a reliable um care like a reliable um reaction with their mother. Like in the past, the mother has been reliable with, uh, with, you know, comfort. And so, you know, when babies cry, the mother has given, given attention, um, and given, um, security, but for insecurely attached babies, either the mother was absent or was just kind of flaky with her ability to be there or not, or she just wasn't really paying attention. Like the, she's been unreliable with her, with her comfort that she's provided. Like she's wishy-washy with, you know, being there. And so that, you know, creates this insecurely attached child. Um, so 60% of babies are securely attached. It's a majority, but these insecurely attached babies just did not have parents that were um, uh, consistent with their, uh, with their comfort and, and, and being there. So there is a critical period for attachment, meaning that like, if you don't have some sort of attachment with a caregiver, um, like it's a use it or you lose it type of scenario. Like if you don't have that within the first few years after birth, then there is no getting it. Um, if you don't have that securely attached relationship with a caregiver, it doesn't have to be a mother, um, then it doesn't develop at all. And so, um, you know, it's very important in, in social development to have some sort of form of attachment because it's not something that can be learned later. Um, so this term imprinting does not apply to humans. It applies to other animals um, like birds. Imprinting means that there's some sort of critical period for attachment right after birth. This does not happen with humans. Humans, um, we have, you know, the first year of our life with our caregiver that we are developing an attachment. But birds will like attach itself to like the very first thing that it sees after it like it hatches. So it hatches out of an egg and the very first thing that a bird sees, it attaches to whether it's their mother or not. So like, that's why you've, you've maybe you've seen like birds maybe imprint on like a dog 
or imprint on another animal. And so they have a secure attachment to this other thing. Um, doesn't really happen that way for, for humans. Humans do not securely attach themselves to like the doctor that helped deliver them. No, we don't do that. But if we were a bird, we might. Um, and so like in the animal kingdom, that like secure attachment is shortly after birth, not for humans though. So go and watch this video. No, don't click that. Oh no. Okay. I hope I don't break law rules that way. I'm going to move you. All right. Let's talk about parenting styles. Um, so there are three. I mean, technically there's a fourth one. The fourth one is just the uninvolved parent, but we're talking about the parents that are actually here, like there. And so there is the authoritarian parent. This is the dictator parent where you have lots of harsh rules, harsh expectations, high expectations, obedience, strict, like they're going to be the dictator type parent. Um, you know, they have really, really high expectations and very harsh punishments when uh, expectations are not met. So obviously the problem with this is that it doesn't create the most well-rounded person. Um, children that have those uh, obedient uh, dict dictator type parents suffer from depression more, anxiety, even aggression, because, you know, they kind of mirror what they see at home. And so a dictator type parent, you know, my way or the highway, does not, is not the best form of parenting. Neither is the opposite, the permissive parent. The permissive parent is going to be the friend parent, like, oh, you know, I don't care if they drink as long as they do it in my house type of thing. Like, oh, my mom and my, we're the best friends. That's not a normal functional relationship. That is not how parents should be. So uh, they're typically indulgent, give the child whatever they want, no rules. There's no boundaries. They they don't enforce. They might be rules, but maybe they're not enforced. Like, oh, don't do this again or you're going to trouble. And then you do it again and then nothing happens. That's a permissive parent. Um, the problem that it creates is their effect on the child. Um, the, the child maybe lacks impulse control because they always get what they want all the time. So they don't have those self-regulating tendencies. Uh, they typically have low academic achievement and they have increased alcohol use um, because they typically, they typically are not made to follow rules um, like governmental rules and, and laws and things like that. So there's three types of parenting styles. And so far, two, have the, two of them have been the bad one. Uh, there's one last one. This is the good type of parent, authoritative. Don't confuse that with authoritarian. Authoritarian is dictator. Authoritative is going to be a very well-communicated parent-child relationship. There's reasonable demands, um, you know, they, and there's punishments, but they're like well understood ahead of time. There's no like surprise of what you're going to get. Um, they're very responsive. They are, they're there for you. And what's the good thing for this is how it affects the child. They're independent because they've always had support and been supported. So they feel like they can go and do things because they know that there's someone to support them. Um, they're self-reliant. They're successful. They're typically well-behaved children uh, when they have the authoritative parent. Not authoritarian. That's the bad one. Authoritative. So, you know, the, the punishment, there's, there's rules, um, but the rules are not crazy. And they're also enforced in a, in a predictable way. Um, and that's, that's the difference between authoritarian sometimes where it's like, you know, the punishment's this big, but the crime's really, really, or sorry, the other way, the crime's this big, but the punishment, you know, is huge. Well, authoritative, you know, the punishment matches the crime. Small, small crime, small punishment, big crime, big punishment. And it's also well communicated ahead of time. Okay, at the very beginning, at the front of the room, Maybe you've picked one of these up before. Looks like this. So this is actually relatively new uh, in AP psychology. I've never had to teach this before, but it's uh, ecological systems. And it's like how we interact with our environment, um, but also uh, like combines nature and nurture in like it, uh, in our environment, in our development, but also kind of like, you know, if you've ever heard the term, like it takes a village to raise a child. This kind of like adds to that. It definitely takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes more than just a village. And so 
this link right here is a really good video. I do want you to go and watch this. It's only like five, six, seven minutes long uh, that you could watch this after this. Uh, so this is Yuri uh, Bronfenbrenner is the is the psychologist that um, created these circles. Uh, and we have we're going to work our way from in to out. So this is you. This is the inner circle. This is you. And the microsystem is the very first ecological system that you're going to interact with. This is the environment that you interact with every single day. So it has more information on these circles up at the front. You can also add to it with the video. This is your work, your school, your family, your neighborhood, your friends. These are the people that you interact with daily. This is your little micro system. And then the next is the meso system. So the meso system is like how those things in the micro system interact with each other. So remember the micro system was like school, work, family, friends, neighbors. But the meso system is how like your school and your friends interact or the interaction between your family and your neighbors or your work and school and how all of these things in the micro system, how they interact with each other, the connections that they have between each other. Further out is the exosystem. This is going to be external environmental settings. Um, so this is going to be a little bit bigger than you, a little, maybe that's something you don't deal with on a daily basis, but parents, friends, or extended family, mass media, the gov like local governments, things that are in your sphere, your realm, but things that you don't necessarily deal with every day. So maybe like coworkers, maybe, um, that you don't necessarily see all the time. Um, things that are bigger than you. And the macro system is going to be like, I mean, it's kind of in the name macro, the broader cultural uh, societal context. So in uh, the picture, you have the social norms, our economic system, the culture that you live in, your political systems. Um, and this would be like more like federal government, like democracy versus like a dictatorship. Uh, that would be your macro system. And the chrono system is that last circle and it's time, the dimension of time, life transitions, historical events that you exist in. Um, and so what you need to do is watch this video because the video gives some really great examples, uh, better than what I just gave. Um, but go watch this video clip right there because that is the end of our lesson for today. So uh, you should have watched this today, taken notes, but then also watch two video clips. This one right here about Mary Ainsworth's strange situation, as well as the ecological systems theory to add on to your circles right here. All right, guys, have a good day.